So let's do a little background here because as we're, where do I belong? That's the sermon series that we're in, but let's go back and we've got to have some background and some context. So last week, as we introduced this new sermon series, which is going to go until Advent and really through the new year, uh, up to the new year, uh, wanted to give you this understanding. This is important. So number one, we begin with worship. Why do we worship Jesus Christ? I got an email from somebody yesterday who was wanting to know with their child is asking these questions. Oh, why, why are we Christians? There's one reason, the resurrection. Take away the resurrection, it all falls apart. Why do we worship Jesus? Because he's the only one, not Moses, not Muhammad, not Confucius, not anybody else that has been killed and came back from the dead. That's why we worship. And because of the resurrection, all of the promises of Jesus that we're going to read today, all of those things that Jesus said and all of the things that he did have a new vitality and validity. And so because of the resurrection, the crucifixion makes sense that he died for our sins, but God raised him from the dead. Because of the resurrection, we have Christmas, that God became a human being. Without the resurrection, then he's just another dead man. But the resurrection changes everything, even the day of worship, because the Jews would worship on Shabbat, Friday, sat, Friday to Saturday, sundown to sundown. It changed the day of worship from Shabbat to Sunday. Why? Because the resurrection happened on Sunday morning. And that's when they discovered that Jesus Christ is risen. So from that, we worship, and that will go forever and ever, and uh, amen, as Revelation says. But from that sense of worship, then, we have three things that the church is commanded to do. Number one is that we have a sense of place of belonging, and that's what we're talking about right now, that we belong to Christ, and we belong to His body, the church. And these two go together. It's not one or the other. We, we are together in this. We belong to Christ and we belong to his church. And so there is to be this sense of belongingness, of love and acceptance and forgiveness that we extend to others. We also want to learn, and that's why we study, and that's why we have sermons, and we want people to come to Christ, but we want people to grow in their faith and understand what this is about. And we're always growing. We're always learning. Third, we're going to be doing a day of service, the second Sunday, or the second, yeah, the second Sunday in September. And with that, we're going to be going to all kinds of different places in Tulsa. But if we go and we have an attitude when we get there, if we're complaining, oh, I didn't want to go here, and I wish this was over with, that sort of a thing, the sense of love, acceptance, and forgiveness needs to show up in our service and that we serve in a good way. But if we don't serve, we just love one another and read the Bible to one another, then we become a, an, an inclusive fellowship of only ourselves. And so we are on mission then to go out and to help other people follow Jesus. So these go together. It begins with worship. But that we love, accept, and forgive one another, we belong. We believe in the gospel. And we just heard the the Apostles' Creed, we believe in those things. We want to learn those things. But it doesn't end with those two. It's carried to fruition through service. And so we serve others. We help others follow Jesus Christ. We give witness to our faith. So with the Gospels now, as you're turning in your Bibles to John chapter 13, verses 31 through 35, it is found in your, if you don't have your Bibles, there are a few Bibles underneath your pews. It's found on page 1070. As you're turning there, remember that the Gospels are four witnesses. And the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are very similar. They're referred to as the, the term is synoptic Gospels, synoptic Gospels, that they're very similar. They tell similar stories. But the fourth Gospel, the Gospel of John, is utterly unique. So in this story, this is the chronology. So it begins with they're at the Last Supper. Now, again, at the Last Supper, it is not as Da Vinci drew it, you know, where they're all 
sitting at the table facing the camera. That's not it. They're laying on the floor, reclining. They've got pillows and everything. And so, so this is a different kind of a perception that we have. So as Jesus is doing that, he takes the bread and he breaks the bread and he said, this is my body and it's going to be broken for you. And then he takes the cup and he says, this is my blood that is poured out for you and for many. And then he says, but one of you is going to betray me. And they begin to talk among themselves. Who could that be? Judas gets up and he takes off. And they still didn't figure it out. Luke chapter 22, verse 24, is stunning. There also broke out among them a dispute. Among them, who among them was the greatest? Now think of this. Jesus has just told them he's going to die. One of them is going to betray. And what did they want to talk about? Who among them was going to get the first spot? And it doesn't say this in the Bible, but I'm sure Jesus must have thought this. What have you not heard one word I said? They didn't. They're jockeying for position. Yeah, Peter, watch him. He thinks he's so smart. James and John is like, yeah, whoever that betrayer is, let's call fire down from heaven and blow him up. And John says, as he records in his gospel, he said, Jesus may love you, but I'm his favorite. <laughs> Think of what's going on, the dynamics in the upper room. And so that's how it ends in Luke's gospel, and, and Jesus says some other things. But here's what's interesting. In John's gospel, I think it begins with chapter 13, verse 1, when somebody had neglected the menial task of washing the feet of the guest. There should have been a servant there. Somebody should have been attending to that. We don't understand that. That's not our culture. We have shoes. We have cars. We have sidewalks. But in those days, when you had walked from place to place, your feet would get dusty, or if it rained, would get muddy or dirty. And when you went to a place, you took off your shoes. That's the culture. And so you're now, you're laying around, on, reclining on a cushion, and you're looking at what? Dirty feet. Somebody had forgotten to wash the feet of the other disciples. There should have been a servant there. But nobody did it, so Jesus dons a towel, and uh, 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 he takes some water, and he begins to wash the feet of the disciples. And he said, blessed are you now that you know these things, if you do them. And so this becomes what he's trying to communicate. It's about humility. It's about love. It's about stooping. Not about saying, I want to be first. I want to be served. Rather, I'm going to, how can I serve? How can I help you to follow Jesus? And so this becomes the dynamic. Now, I told you that John's gospel is utterly unique. If you begin in John chapter 13, and you look at chapter 14, and chapter 15, and chapter 16, and chapter 17, and chapter 18, it's all about what Jesus is telling them until he goes across the Kidron Valley to Gethsemane to pray. These wonderful teachings of Jesus all come in this context of humility, of love, of things that he's going to do. It's not found in the other Gospels, but it's found in John's Gospel. And so when Pastor Bill Mason always goes through and does a memorial service, it's always John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. In my Father's house there are many mansions. When did that happen? When did Jesus say that? In the upper room. So this is the context, how it all fits together. John chapter 13, verses 31 through 35 is our text. It was wonderful I'm not sure how old Bonnie is, but she, she quoted this scripture. She's probably nine years old, something like that. She stood up at the 8 o'clock service today, and she quoted it. It was great. You know, I was like, oh, boy, I hope they don't ask me to do that. So um, I would try, but, boy, that's hard when you're, I'm a little older than nine these days. So this is our text in response to the reverence we have in our heart for God's word. Let's stand as we do our reading. Ready? 
When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Thank you. You may be seated. If there is a hand next to you, take it as we pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So look at verse 34, a new commandment. This is where we get the term Monday Thursday. It's French, a new commandment, a new commandment. Now they had plenty of commandments in the Old Testament. They had one for every day of the year, literally 365 negative commandments, prohibitions, do not do this, do not do this. They had 248 positive commandments for a total of 613. That's why Jesus said, you don't need any more. You got plenty. So he says, I'm going to give you something different though. This is what I want you to do. This is the new commandment. It's not going to be how you're going to keep the Sabbath. It's going to be about a relationship that you have with other people. And that is, you're going to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You're going to love your neighbor, and you're going to love one another. And he tells them how they're going to do that. You are going to love one another through your action. Now, there's a lot of different ways to show action. Um, this is a wonderful, wonderful little book uh, here. I don't know if you... Well, let me get to that. Let's go ahead and, and exegete the text here. We'll, we'll come down to that in just a moment. This is the new commandment, that you love one another. And so, uh, have you, uh, I don't know if you've ever read that book, A Team of Rivals. It was about Abraham Lincoln and, and about his cabinet and how they were rivals. And it's a fascinating, it's a big book, but it's a fascinating book about how that they did not show respect to Lincoln. They did not understand who he was and what he was trying to do. And it was a, it's an amazing book, A Team of Rivals. And that's very much what these guys are. They're a team of rivals. They're jockeying for position. Who's going to be number one? Who does Jesus love best? What can they do? How can they be, how can they be, how can they achieve? They want to go to the top of the organization. So this is what he's trying to say is that you need to love one another. Quit fighting about this. It's not a new commandment. Here's the new commandment, just as I have loved you. How did he love them? He accepted them. He accepted them. And when he did that, and when he showed his acceptance, remember the response of Peter? We looked at it last week in Luke chapter 5, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. Jesus didn't say, you're a sinner, but he showed his love and acceptance and his call. Just as I have loved you, what did Jesus do? He taught them. He was present with them. He prayed for them. He, he, he gave them all kinds of attention. That is a place of belonging that Jesus provided for his disciples. He didn't just like send them text and, you know, he didn't send them a blanket email. He was personally present with them. That's why this journey group that that you heard Denver talking about is so powerful because you're together. You're not doing screens, you're doing flesh and blood. You're talking to people, you're hearing their stories, and what you find when you talk to other people is that we're pretty similar. We all have the same needs and desires, we have the same guilt and fear and anxieties, and we're very, very similar. We just don't get together and talk about it and pray for one another. And so this is what we're trying to do is help people to follow Jesus. A journey is a great way for men to do that. You don't have to be married. You just want to be in a relationship with other men to pray for one another. So this is what he's saying. Just as I have loved you, this is what you're going to, to go about. And he said, by this, by this, by your love. He doesn't say by your programs. He doesn't say by your buildings. He doesn't say by your preaching ability. He doesn't say 
that, but he said by this. What does this mean? By your love. By your love for one another, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, you have in your bulletin the description of what love is, and there are four different words for love that's in your bulletin. I won't go through that now, but you can reference that. But that's a very important thing to understand the agape love that Jesus is talking about here. This is not eros, philios, or storge. This is agape love, and this is a very important thing. So, always want to get to the application. How do we apply this? I've got five points. Number one is by action. Let us not love in words and in speech, but in deed and in truth. Let's show up. Love acts. Or as Bob Goff. Bob Goff came and he was with us. This book, I don't know how many of you have read this. This is just a great book. How many of you read Love Does? A number of you have read this. It's just an extraordinary book. Uh, I, you can read it again and again. It's funny. The guy's got a great sense of humor. When Bob Goff came to Asbury, uh, I got to sit with him, got to be with him a little bit. Genuine, genuine person. Uh, I truly enjoyed this guy. In his very first chapter, he writes this. This is the conclusion. The world may, can make you think that love can be picked up at a garage sale or enveloped in a Hallmark card. But the kind of love that God created and demonstrated is a costly one because it involves sacrifice and presence. That's what Jesus did. Sacrifice and presence. It's a love that operates more like a sign language than being spoken outright. The brand of love Jesus offers is that it's more about presence than undertaking a project. It's a brand of love that just doesn't just think about good things or agree with them or talk about them. The simple truth that continues to weave itself into the tapestry of every great story, love does. Love acts. Love is an action. Journey group, it's an action. It's something you show up to do. You participate. Love does. All kinds of ways that, that this is going to show up. Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, Mr. Rogers loved. He acted. He did something. He cared. He responded. He was present day after day, day after day, year after year, year after year. And so this becomes a way that we, we do that. So Bob Goff has certain things that he does and, and journey group that, and all the discipleship communities. That we, there's all kinds of ways that we do that. Um, one thing that Dana and I used to, we would uh, play cards together, just me and Dana. And we started doing that again. She puts down her screen. I go, I, I don't play games on the computer. I work. And when I go home, I'm usually writing perception scripts at home. I started playing cards with Dana. My mother told me years ago, now Tom, I'm a little bit, I don't know if you know this about me, I'm a little bit competitive. <laughs> so my mother told me years ago, now Tom, you gotta let Dana win every once in a while. So whenever she wins, now I remind her of what my mother said. <laughs> so very humble. You know, how I show, how I do, how I demonstrate love does. I make birthday calls. This year I'll make probably 3,300 birthday calls. I have all kinds of incredible conversations. This is for me. Other pastors may or may not feel similarly inclined, but I've been doing this not in the last week. I've been doing this for the last 10 years, since 2008. I've made 40,000 birthday calls in 10 years, a little bit every day. Why do I do that? It's my way to demonstrate from my heart to yours. I love you, and I'm interested in your life, and I care enough about you. I want to call you, and I want to talk to you. Unfortunately, we've reached a place in our culture where these robocalls have taken over. And so you see this number on your birthday and you say, it's another one of those calls. And so I leave messages. Particularly when you're 50 years of age and under, 
I leave a lot of messages. I want to talk to you. I don't want to text you because you'll text me back and we're going to end up with this long conversation. I'm not a big texter. I'm a talker. I'm not somebody that is married to the screen. I want to look you in the eye. I want to hear your voice. I want to talk to you. We've lost that to a large degree in our culture to the point that some people don't even know how to talk to each other. I'm concerned about that. And it's inconvenient. I'll just text them rather than hear the human voice. That is why there will always be room for the church because there is an innate craving in the human heart for flesh and blood, for human touch. And so I do this. I don't do it to say I'm a wonderful person, but I've found many times at the, you know, things happen here too that are discouraging, that, you know, that, that hurt. There's painful moments that, that take place. What I find replenishes my soul is to call you and say, hey, it's your birthday today. Happy birthday. What's going on? And it's, usually you say, well, I'm glad I'm still here, you know. I'm on the right side of the grass, you know. I mean, I hear those kinds of deals. But it's a celebration. What's going on? This week I had the conversation, and this happens more than you would be, you'd probably be surprised if I can ask the right question. Uh, this week I said, can I pray with you? As we'd had a conversation, and as I prayed, she began to cry. It happens a lot because we're all carrying stuff and we're all looking for a place to belong. And I found this is a consistent method. Bill would go to the hospitals. We still do that, but I prefer the birthday calls because <laughs> you're happy, <laughs> except when it ends in a zero or the government gets involved in your birthday, you're happy. It's a good occasion and it's a uh, a memory of the gift of life. So, we want to do things. We want to talk to people. We want to slow down and we want to have a presence in their lives. We want to look them in the eye and not just blow them off. And so, as we do that, then good things happen. Second, is that there is a sense sometimes of confrontation. And now that might be surprising. How do you love, accept, and well, sometimes you have to speak the hard words. You have to say, listen, because I do love and care for you, I'm not going to be nice. I'll be kind. I'm not going to be nice. I'm going I'm to tell you the truth. But there are different ways you can tell the truth. And so I think of when David committed adultery and Nathan walked in one day and Nathan, uh, David had not only committed adultery, he had murdered, had Uriah murdered Bathsheba's husband. And so he walks in. Nathan did and says, hey, King David, I've got this great story I want to tell you. And so David's like, okay, it's a story about this rich man, and he had, he had lots of money, and he had lots of sheep and everything, and there's this poor guy, and he only had one lamb, and, and he really loved his lamb as a family pet. And one day some guests came, and the rich guy said, I'm going to take that guy's one lamb, and I'm going to get it uh, for a barbecue. And the man cried and wept. He took my only lamb, and, uh, and David's a shepherd. He jumps up. He says, this is terrible. This is awful. And Nathan says, David, I'm talking about you. You've done this. You took somebody's wife that did not belong to you, and you killed the man. David, you're the man. It was a story, and David got the point. I think of another way to confront. The disciples are arguing. Who's the greatest? It's me. No, it's me. No, it's me. I'm his favorite. No, no. And while they're doing the arguing, guess what Jesus is doing? Stooping and washing their feet. It all begins, love begins with humility, a willingness to say, you go first. I'll take the back seat. This is how people know that we're followers of Jesus, that there is humility. Even in our confrontations, I could be wrong, but this is my perception. This is what I'm observing. I could be wrong. We approach confrontation in that way. Third, I had a couple in my office yesterday. I'll be doing their wedding this coming Saturday night. And as we were talking, I said, I get to say one thing to couples that are getting married because you're not going to listen to anything else. I thought it was cute yesterday in my office when the young man yawned. Uh, so <laughs> that's great. Uh, 
What's, what's my one saying to couples that are getting married? Very good, very good. Lower your expectations, raise your commitment. Think of Jesus now. What did he do? Did he have these expectations that the disciples were going to understand this? No. He lowered his expectations, not his standard and not what he was going to do because he didn't feel like it, but he's going to the cross and he's going to die. He lowered his expectation of Judas, of Peter, of James and John. He lowered his expectations, but he increased his commitment to going to the cross. Fourth, we've got to forgive. Now, Forgiveness and reconciliation are two different things. Some of us have gone through divorces. And it doesn't mean that we're going to get remarried, but forgiveness needs to happen at some point. Because it's a prison that we live in that is painted ourselves in a corner when we don't forgive. It's toxic. It's drinking poison. You don't want that. You've got to pour it out. We've got to forgive. Jesus forgave Judas. Jesus forgave Peter. He forgave all of the disciples for not showing up. Jesus forgave Thomas. Thomas was someone who doubted. Jesus forgave. And we follow his model. Finally, don't try this at home without the Holy Spirit. And they couldn't do this at this point until the Holy Spirit came into their lives. And you'll see in the next chapter and in chapter 16 that Jesus is talking to his disciples, I'm going to give you myself. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that gives us this power. In conclusion, I watched a movie this week. Uh, it's called Chappaquiddick. I don't want to get into the politics. That's not the purpose. The other purpose of telling you this is a glimpse at Senator Ted Kennedy. And remember that at the same time we're walking on the moon, Kennedy drives the car off and Mary Jo Kopechny is killed in a very shallow body of water. And it was a scandal, it was a terrible, terrible thing. There was a death. Forget the politics, but what the movie showed me and why I bring it up is because it shows the relationship between Ted Kennedy and his father. The star of the family was Joseph Kennedy Jr., who was killed in a World War II uh, plane that was shot down uh, as he was flying for the United States in that war. The second son was assassinated, JFK, and Robert Kennedy was killed in 1968. There are four sons. Teddy was the fourth in many ways. He wasn't first, second, third, and in his father's radar, he was a loser. And this comes across in the movie. And there is this yearning. He's messed it up. He's not like his, his older brothers. He's the, he's the runt of the litter. And this is like something that is stained within his soul and that he knows his father does not love or accept him as his son. And he pleads with his father and as I was watching that, it reminded me of the story in Genesis of Jacob and Esau. Jacob stole Esau's birthright, and Esau goes in, and when he finds out that the blessing has been taken as well, he pleads with his father, and he says, bless me, bless me also, my father. And the father can't do it. The blessing has already been taken by his brother, by, by Jacob. And Esau is this wail of a desperate man, and I heard that same voice in Teddy Kennedy saying, bless me, my father, and the father refused. This is so important. Where do I belong? Because some of us feel like we don't belong because our moms and our dads never blessed us. Some of us struggle because of adoption our whole life, like Steve Jobs, struggle with that all of our lives. Some of us feel like that we have blown it. We have, we've created some terrible situation for our family. We've embarrassed our family. We don't deserve it. Uh, and we feel like we want to be blessed, but we don't know who is going to bless us. This is why I so prize and love what I get to do, because I'm able to say this is about resurrection. This is about dead people coming to life again. 
And that's what Jesus Christ does for us. He resurrects not only him, but he resurrects us and he gives us new birth. It was wonderful to talk to, hear Stephen's story this week. Had a birthday this week. Stephen had a birthday this week. I called him and I said, hey, tell me what's going on. I'm going to get baptized. Why do you want to get baptized this week? Because it's my birthday. And as I shook his hand just a moment ago, I said, happy birthday, happy birthday. He's got two birthdays born in Christ, born physically, but born spiritually. That's what we're about. We're saying resurrection. Don't go to the casino and think you're going to win your happiness. You're not going to find it in a garage sale either. That's what he's saying. You're going to find your joy through the one who's been resurrected, the only one who can give us life, eternal life through him, give us purpose and meaning, give us a community, give us a family, give us the body of Christ. This is who we are. And we're on mission. If you've never received Jesus Christ into your life, it's time for a birthday. It's time to open your heart and to say, I don't have to perform anymore. I may have missed those other blessings, but there's a greater blessing still. And this is from God the Father through Jesus Christ, the resurrected one. Secondly, I want you to pray not only for your own soul, but I want you to pray for our church that we will be people that are passionately engaged in saying, we're going to go about this with humility. I'm going to renounce that sense of superiority, of demand, that the church do it my way, that the church does this, the church does that. I'm going to repent of that. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stoop, and I'm going to wash the feet of other people. I'm going to sign up. I'm going to be a participant in the activities and the ministry of the church. I'm going to be that person. I want to serve. I want to help other people follow Jesus Christ. That's why I'm here. I'm here to help you, and you're here to help me, that together we can follow Jesus Christ and we can help others follow him. Is there someone on your heart? Is it a spouse? Is it a neighbor? Is it a child? Is it a parent? Is it a friend? Maybe he's not following Jesus Christ. You have the opportunity to speak those words if you'll be on a mission, if you've given your life to Christ, join us in that mission. This is a time to pray. I want to invite you. The altar is open for either of these things. Jay's available. I'm around. Daniel's over here. You can have whatever. You don't have to pray with a pastor, but we're available if we can help you. We'd just like to give you a few minutes to respond. This is your invitation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.